Hello and welcome to First Flight, a Star Trek Enterprise rewatch podcast where we are watching and discussing each episode of Enterprise in succession. First Flight is a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Network. This is Commander Tucker of Enterprise. We've got some information you're going to want to hear. Welcome to all you Enterprise fans for the First Flight Season 1 Wrap-Up Bonanza. I'm your co-host, Abby. And I'm your co-host, Melanie. And tonight we'll be going over all of Season 1 and discussing each main character, the big season story arcs, all the stats of our ratings from the season, and to top it all off, we're giving out a Golden Porthos and a final Vulcan's Verdict for the season. It's a fun-filled look back at what we loved about Season 1 of Enterprise. And now Melanie has a couple shout-outs for us. Melanie? Thanks, Abby. Before we jump in, I just wanted to extend some thank yous on behalf of both of us. I want to say thank you to the wonderful First Flight community for listening to our show and for participating with us online. It's been so much fun. We've loved hearing your thoughts and your picks. And it's been really great sharing the love of Enterprise with our friends from around the world. And also, I want to give a shout out to our behind-the-scenes First Flight support team. Our appreciation goes out to Jeff Hewlett and the Tricorder Transmissions Network for hosting our show. Big thanks to our amazing podcast editing support team of Anya B. and Jeanette Balthazar. And to Brian Huddleston, our awesome technical consultant and art logo designer. We couldn't do it without you. And our last thank you goes out to our good friend, Jim Morehouse, whose show here on the Tricorder Transmissions Network, Trek Ranks, is what brought Melanie and I together. Jim was invaluable to the startup of this podcast, and we both thank him deeply for the support and suggestions along the way. And in his honor, we created the first part of our show tonight, the Character Spotlight. We'll be talking about each of the seven main characters, Trek Rank style, by distilling our thoughts down to a five-word summary and a hashtag with a brief chat after. Okay, Melanie, let's deploy our subspace amplifier and get going. Now, before we get started, I do want to point out that we did not share any of these ahead of time. And so if we have any duplicates, that's just because we happen to be Star Trek brain twins. And we again, we've discussed all of these characters in huge amounts of detail on previous episodes. So if you want to hear more of that, go back and listen to our previous season. We are really distilling it down here. All right. So, Melanie, we couldn't start with anyone but our captain. Archer, five words and a hashtag, please. Okay. Childhood dreams can come true. Hashtag the right stuff. What's unique about Enterprise is this is truly a first flight, quote unquote, because Warp 5 allowed them to venture into the unknown for the first time with a brand new captain. So of course he will make some mistakes and learn as he goes. And I love and appreciate that. Had a little bit of a rough start there at the beginning. He has his prejudice to Vulcans, him threatening assault on Paul, not cool. But what I really love about Archer is he does reflect on his errors. He admits them. And overall, damn, did he do a fantastic job as captain with amazing success. From fostering morale, being empathetic, to dealing with life and death experiences, thinking on his feet quickly over and over again, he proved that he is a terrific leader and captain. Big Jonathan Archer fan here. He's really down to earth, and I appreciate his integrity, his instincts, his caring, his passion about the mission. Scott Bakula did such a great job creating such a beloved character. I can't imagine anyone else as Jonathan Archer, and he's one of Starfleet's finest. For me, he's the heart of the show and the crew. That was beautiful. And I think you summed up a lot of what I was going to say, but 
Here's my five words and a hashtag and a little bit of my two cents. So my five words are first captain for a reason. And my hashtag, I had to do it, faith of the heart. Because (laughs) this is Archer. He has believed in this mission. He has believed in humanity. He has believed in going out and finding a broader community since he was a kid, just like you said. And I also appreciate that he isn't perfect. Nobody is. I enjoy a flawed person who reflects, like you said again. And no matter what he does, his instincts are correct. We've seen over and over again, he can size up a situation in a heartbeat. And he's not afraid to make tough decisions when he has to. And he, he, as the season goes on, calls on more and more of the people around him to be his sounding board and help him out. So he's that captain in the right place at the right time. And as we've seen in more recent Trek, it couldn't have been anybody but him. All right, so let's move on to our favorite resident science officer, to Paul. Melanie, five words and a hashtag. Okay, to Paul, steadfast loyalty and wise guidance. Hashtag layered and deep. Talk about a character arc from her to look beyond your provincial attitudes and your volatile natures and that very awkward, intense ready room scene in Broken Bow to us just recently discussing her bond with and going to bat for Archer and the crew in Shockwave. What a journey. I absolutely adore this character and I can't stress enough how much she brings to the show. And I love that we get to be a part of her personal journey that is happening simultaneously with the Enterprise Adventures. And you know, Abby, when I was thinking about her, I thought of another TOS callback. There's that part in A Mock Time when Kirk says to Spock, you've been called the best first officer in the fleet. That's an enormous asset to me. And it made me think about how much T'Pol has brought to this crew that Archer was savvy enough to realize that he should keep her on and how incredibly valuable she was and is to this mission. Yeah, that's a really nice way to sum up this early to Paul. And you're right, there's nothing and no one who could have filled the slot that she did the way she did. So I was kind of on the the same idea as you hear with her arc of, of growing. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite hashtags I've ever thought up. So my five words are expanding her mind with humans. And my hashtag says, depending on how you read it, either a typical Vulcan, or a typical Vulcan. Ooh, nice. I was really proud of that one, because <laughs> I'm that kind of nerd. But um, I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy about T'Pol, is she was full Vulcan, as far as we know, take out all those fan theories. And she was steeped in Vulcan culture. She had all the Vulcan thoughts about humans. And just as much as Archer opens his mind, she opens hers back. And this season is the beginning of that relationship that has powerful moments now, but we know is only going to grow and become an even tighter bond as the seasons go on. And I like that she is not afraid to be atypical sometimes, whether that's the influence of humans or her actual nature or some of both. We'll never know, but it makes her a fascinating character. Go to Paul. All right. So to round out our big three, let's talk trip. What do you got, Melanie? All right. Five words. Keep your shirt on, Lieutenant. (laughs) Hashtag charm galore. Let me start by saying Trip is my favorite character on Enterprise, besides Porthos. Ha ha. <laughs> He's also experiencing a lot of character growth when you think back to how he was thinking in Strange New World to now. I think in some ways he kind of represents the everyman to us. I absolutely love his personality. He brings so much. Wit, joy, charm, realness. The adjectives are endless. His friendship with Archer is nicely played and an asset. And in addition to his great personality, his engineering prowess 
serves the ship and crew so well, and his mechanical brilliance plays into the great success of this first season for the crew. Yeah, that was absolutely a perfect way to sum up Trip. And I have to tell you, when I was doing mine, this was the hardest one for me. Like, I to distill him down to five words in a hashtag is really hard because I feel like he is such a multi-layered character once you really start thinking about it. He's not just all Southern drawl and fried catfish and pecan pie and you know, jokes with Archer and hate and Vulcans. He's got so many layers straight from the beginning, and that's something I really appreciate with Trip. So my words lined up a lot with yours. So my five words were heart always on his sleeve, and my hashtag was charming competence. Because I think that, you know, you, again, he is so charming. And we see that over and over with different alien species that they meet. But he is so smart. He is the chief engineer on this ship for a reason. How many times did he save them? How many times did he figure stuff out? I mean, how many times did he recalculate and push them further than they thought? And, you know, he was the one whose engine made it to warp five the first time. I mean, the whole ship gets that honor. but. But Trip gets a little spe- special bump there for being the first engineer who's, whose engine actually hit warp five for humanity. So bravo to Trip. This season was just the beginning of his journey. He's got some, some hard turns coming up and some tough stuff. So it was nice to see the layers of this early trip. All right. So let's move on to our favorite armory officer, Malcolm Reed. Melanie, you're up. All right. Malcolm Reed. Five words. Blowing stuff up with gusto. (laughs) Hashtag by the book. As we both talked about many times throughout the season, this is the character that has grown on me the most. I've come to develop such a deep appreciation for Malcolm Reed. And as you have said so well, Abby, he is everything that you would want in a tactical officer. You know that the mission will be a success with Malcolm leading the charge. You feel secure about it, and you don't give it a moment's thought. He's always thinking ahead and anticipating, and he's reliable, dependable, loyal, efficient, responsible, innovative. As we talked about on ShuttlePod 1, we learn that there's more to Malcolm. We learn more about his deep feelings about his crew and his family and that he's much more layered than just being an efficient guy. Yeah. Malcolm is such a shining star for me in this rewatch, and I'm so glad for it. It has really made me appreciate this character and his arc in the series in a whole new light. And while some will say it was not as heavy and filled in as some of the other characters, there's a lot there, especially when you're looking at all of the little, you know, people call them throwaway scenes, but there's a heap of character development in there. And I'm telling you, I am never looking at a pineapple cake again the same way. Probably never <laughs> looking at a pineapple again the same way. But uh, my five words are damn good at his job, hashtag force fields and explosions. So let's not forget that while we know he likes to blow stuff up and much prefers the shooting back part, he is also the guy who fine-tuned and first used a force field. So yep. that's that's a huge, huge thing. If nothing else, that would get him in the history books. And that is just one thing that he's like, oh, yeah, our ship's getting taken over by a goo monster. Let's finish up this force field thing I've been tinkering with in my spare time. Malcolm is the guy you want around to help you be safe and to make sure that everything is going to go the way it needs to go. Okay, we've passed the halfway point. The next person we need to discuss is our favorite linguist, Hoshi Sato. What are your five words and a hashtag for her, please, Melanie? Okay, Hoshi. Fear of flying to bad ass. Hashtag renaissance woman. Of all the characters arcs we'll be discussing this season, I think hers is the most significant. I've talked about how I can relate to Hoshi's anxiety and how I would probably feel similarly on a ship at first. And when you think back to that first meeting in Brazil with her anxiety of being on the ship, standing next to the warp reactors, being jumpy, stars going backwards, 
her away mission in fight or flight, the sluggo analogy to her initiating breakthroughs with the universal translator, being absolutely brilliant, going undercover, Hmm. being a people person, solving life or death situations like in Sleeping Dogs, basically handling anything that's thrown to her. She can handle anything and deal with everything with supreme excellence, communicating regularly with aliens such as Box Sola, She's just an all-around badass, and I think it goes without saying that this mission would not be successful without her. She's amazing. I absolutely adore your giant list of everything how she did this season. When you hear it laid out like that, how could you say that she was anything less than incredible? My words and hashtag go right along with what you were saying. I have genius linguist grow space legs and hashtag human UT. So I I had the exact same idea. I mean, this woman does everything and she does all of it while dealing with the fact that she's not immensely comfortable. And I think while we said that, you know, Trip is kind of the heart of the show, sometimes we all understand his feelings and emotions. And he says the things we're feeling right along with the crew. Well, Hoshi is more of the who we probably are overall. So both of them really offer such a nice look into what it would be like to be on Enterprise. And, you know, I really always appreciated Hoshi being, you know, one of the smartest people on the ship and not being afraid to ask for help, too. I mean, it takes her a while sometimes. She wants to crack it herself, but when she needs help, she asks for it and she accepts it. And that is powerful. Indeed. All right. Five down, two to go. Travis Mayweather, he's up next. What do you got, Melanie? Okay, five words. Fab piloting from Resident Boomer. Hashtag the sweet spot. Okay, for the record, I just want it to be known. I absolutely adore Travis. He's one of my favorite Star Trek characters. And it goes without saying that I wish they had given him more to do. So while I don't think his arc is as extensive as the others this season, he certainly did grow and learn and gain skills this first season, like in Box Solo when he's talking to the Kratassans and the other episodes as well. He's just so damn personable. (laughs) I really appreciate his positivity and his open-mindedness. He's not afraid to speak his mind when necessary. And I like that he brings the boomer's perspective. We definitely needed more of that. He's just a great all-around person and spectacular pilot. And if I were serving on Enterprise, I would definitely want to hang out with Travis. That's a really good way to put it. Yes, I would want to hang out with Travis too. And I always have hoped somewhere in the back of my mind that he wrote a really good autobiography like later in his life, talking about growing up as a boomer, being on Enterprise, and everything that he does after. Like, I would read that book. So... Okay, I was kind of on this same idea, and I have to say I almost did hashtag sweet spot as well. That was my second choice. So, all right, my five words were experienced helmsman's a great asset and hashtag resident boomer. So I'm glad we got that in there. We got the sweet spot because that is still one of my very favorite parts of Enterprise, and I I wish they had (laughs) used it more. I understand why they didn't, but it's still a super cool idea. And, you know, just like you said, Travis Heck comes with so much knowledge, so much experience and different experience than what our people who have gone through Starfleet and all that have had because he's been out there and he is really young. But at the same time, he's one of the most expert crew members on lots of different things. And that's a really interesting juxtaposition. And I love his friendship with Hoshi. I love how they have buddied up and they've really, you know, come to have each other's backs and they have all these little throwaway looks and moments on the bridge that are just cool. And while I think that, you know, Travis always needs more, this first episode had some meaty stuff for him and he saved the day or identified something or figured something out more times than one would think as well. So if we made a list for him like we did for Hoshi, I think people would be surprised. Excellent points, Abby. I'm so glad you brought up all those perspectives of Travis. And you know what? I never knew I needed an autobiography of Travis Mayweather (laughs) until just now. 
but I am reading that book. <laughs> Somebody write it, please. All right, and rounding out our seven main characters is our favorite Denobulan, Dr. Flox. Melanie, your last set of five words and a hashtag. All right, here we go. Delightful dose of Denobulan doctoring. Nice. Hashtag optimism, Captain. Before I jump into this, can I just say how beloved this guy is? Yeah. Look up sparkling personality <laughs> in a dictionary, and it is Phlox. His combination of effervescent joy and charm with outstanding medical skills is just incredible. And of course, he gives us that alien slash Denobulan perspective on humanity, often with T'Pol, as we've talked about their conversations being so important in this first season. Yeah. And even though in Shockwave, he seems perfectly fine with moving on to his next assignment, you just know that deep down he is bonded to this crew, and that has to have some impact on him. I think this assignment on board gave him way more insight into humans and exploring ethics and dilemmas, much more than it would have been if he had just been in the interspecies medical exchange on Earth. And regarding his season arc, he goes from, sure, I'll sign up. Why not? From the beginning of Broken Bow to really being a vital and entwined part of the crew and family. And I know we're talking about season one, but if we jump forward to Terra Prime mm -hmm. later, when he talks about how he didn't expect to gain another family, yeah, that kind of hits me too. So Flox is an absolute highlight of Enterprise for me. And I just adore him. Yeah, I don't know how anybody could not like Flax. He is just so lovable and so open. Like, you know that if you walked into his sick bay, you would feel loving kindness around you, even if he was telling you the worst possible news. Mm -hmm. So I had I had similar ideas. My five words were consistent, kind, brilliant, alien insights, hashtag Denobulan smile. Because I love that extra big smile. That's one of the first things that we see about Flox because it makes him just that little bit alien, but it's the most disarmingly charming alien move. Like, I'm going to smile at you extra big. Like, it, it's just so Flox. And he has a lot of the humor, but also a lot of the heart of Enterprise in this. And he is always there in the heart of these episodes that have those ethical quandaries. And I think that John Billingsley did a brilliant job making us like Denobulans. We didn't know anything about them until Flax walked on our screen. And by the end of this first season, we know a great deal about Denobulans. And if every Denobulan is even a tenth as cool as Flax, then that's a planet I'm headed to soon. Absolutely. I love that we learn about his culture. And I'm glad you mentioned his caring and his warmth because... That's such a huge part of who he is, and I love that. So, Melanie, we did it. We distilled a season's worth of character arcs and growth and stories and moments into a somewhat manageable chunk. Do you have a final takeaway for us? Yeah, I think I do. Recently, I was thinking about how the cast of Strange New Worlds gelled so well from the beginning mm -hmm. and i've always felt that that was the same thing with enterprise so they really kicked it off on a great foot with the cast gelling together so it even goes to show how much more they did by the end of the season how we've really come to love and be a part of this crew and i i just feel like they all worked together so well and that's why i think these characters in this show has always been so dear to my heart. Yeah, you know, I think my my big takeaway from that is very similar. And I think that it's it's nice to see that if you think about this like a book, this is that first, you know, quarter to third of a novel. It's a lot of plot exposition, it's a lot of character development, it's a lot of figuring out relationships and getting to the part where you can do the shorthand. And that's not always a, something we see represented in media a lot. We see established relationships and we're 
coming in at the middle. It's nice to see all of these start and grow. And I have always been massively curious about this part of the timeline. So yeah, I, I love enterprise and I came away. My big takeaway is this feels like my family and I, mm-hmm. I am okay with that. Okay, so we have covered all of our main characters, and now it's time for the three biggest story arcs of the season. And again, we have gone through all of these in depth with every episode, so this is kind of just our our overall thoughts and our wrap up for these arcs here. So the first of our three arcs here is the humans versus Vulcans versus Andorian storyline. Melanie, what are your overall thoughts on this for season one? Well, I am a big fan of Vulcans, and I'm a big fan of Andorians. I love them both. So one of my favorite things about Enterprise is that the show does focus on these two species, and especially in the first season where they plant the seeds and give us some introductions to them. So I am all for that. And, you know, Abby, I think the Vulcans get a lot of flack in this show and in this season. I know a lot of fans were not happy about how they were portrayed in Enterprise as being kind of prickly and pompous and holding us back and not really being what we were used to seeing in Vulcans. And, you know, I respect people's opinions about that. But for me, I like the complexity. I like that they made the Vulcans this way in Enterprise. I found it interesting. People do change, species evolve, and I think it's really fascinating evolution and journey of growth that we're seeing. And I know later in the series, we'll see more about the Cyrenites and Surak background and how mind melds were viewed and the changing of the guard and how the high command was operating and all of that. But right now, I'm loving what we're getting. And I have to say, I find also the Andorians extremely intriguing. Loved them in TOS briefly that we got and always wanted to know more. And what better ambassador can we find than Shran and Jeffrey Combs? So what I thought was really interesting was we have the three different points of the triangle here. We have all the seats planted for how the Vulcans relate to Andorians, how the Vulcans relate to humans, how the Andorians relate to the Vulcans. They have their own mini thing going on that we learn about from T'Pol to Archer how the Andorians are with the humans. We have all the different complexities of the different combinations of relationships. And that's just going to continue to evolve. And I am here for that. Melanie, I couldn't have said it any better because if I didn't know better, I would have thought you'd read my notes. I had some of the exact same wording that you had about lots of flack for the Vulcans and the triangle. (laughs) So look at that. We are definitely on the same page. But yeah, my feelings are very similar. This arc is always a great part of Enterprise, and it continues all the way through the entire series, which I really appreciate because we see parts of these relationships starting in the first quarter of this season. And that's really neat to see something that was that long reaching. And I also agree that the Vulcans being so different was shocking to many people, but no species is immune to growth and change. And I liked seeing them grow and change as the relationships with each other deepen and get more trusting. And that's with all three parts of that same triangle. And I think it's interesting because if you think about them as an actual triangle, when one side would pull, the others would get pushed. And I think they realize that they're all way more interconnected than they ever thought and for some of them hoped to be. And that's an interesting realization that we see them starting to get here that if we were going to hang in this part of space, we're going to see each other a lot. So we need to we need to figure out how to make this work. And I love that we have T'Pol there because, like I said earlier with my hashtag, she is both a typical and atypical Vulcan. And she adds so much to the relationships that they all have with other Vulcans because they have a good relationship with her and a growing trust with her. And she's got a decent trust with the High Council, so she she can speak on the human's behalf too. And that's an interesting piece of that mm-hmm. triangle. And yeah, Shran. Like I could just I could wax poetic about Shran for I don't know an hour or two, <laughs> and then add Jeffrey Combs, and it would be you know an entire seminar. 
So we will get so much more of Shran, and I am so glad. But from the minute he walked onto our screen and those antennas moved, you knew that this guy was important. And I think it is really neat when he shows up in places that you don't expect and that he helps out. And he's so honorable. And even though he is so different and not always the kindest, um, he he is honorable. He has a code of conduct and he's standing true to it. And you know what? He's right about the Vulcan sometimes. So, so interesting to see this. And this is all, you know, pretty much political drama, which can be a little dull, but it's not with these species. It really, really isn't. And I love that this arc grows over every season and it always leaves me wanting more. And even when the series was done, I wished we had seen more of this. It's a solid beginning to what we know is going to eventually end up as the founding of the Federation, which is cool. Well said, Abby. These are the founders of the Federation. And here we are getting to see it happen and grow from the very beginning. We're along for that ride. All right. So let's move on to the second big arc. And I didn't even know quite how to name this. So I called it There's a lot we don't know. We need a directive, maybe. (laughs) And I'll start with this one, since that was a very nebulous arc title. And this is basically the the ethical quandaries that they find themselves in when they're first exploring space. Different species, different codes of conduct, keeping their human traditions, but respecting other people's, and getting into some situations and pickles that they didn't expect. And didn't quite know how to handle. And, you know, to to quote another famous captain, you know, you can take no wrong steps and still lose the battle. And sometimes that happened in Enterprise this season. And Archer wished he had had a guideline or a directive or something to fall back on that would have given him more guidance of how to deal with some of these these sticky situations that could come down to life and death for either his crew or other people. And I know Archer takes a beating in the fandom for not knowing what's going on and making choices other captains wouldn't. But you know what? That's his job. He's first. And we (laughs) never would have gotten to the Prime Directive if we did not have firsthand experiences that ended both well and poorly so that we could know how we wanted to craft this directive. We needed that experience. And that's what the crew of the NX-01 is doing, especially in this first season. And I love that they have T'Pol and Phlox there for a good outside perspective and that they don't always wrap things up in a nice, neat bow. Like I think about the end of Desert Crossing where Archer is talking about how he's not going to help the people who petitioned him. And it's too bad because he thinks he had a good cause. And that's where they leave it. That's the gray that I love about Mm -hmm. Enterprise. And that's why this arc has always felt so powerful to me and why a lot of episodes that you might, you know, sort into this arc are some of my favorites because we love Trek for the ethical dilemmas that it shows us and presents to us and makes us think about it. And Enterprise isn't short on them. And that's why we keep talking about this decades later. You bring up some really good points, Abby. I agree. And there definitely was a need for some type of prime directive to come along. And I think besides Dear Doctor, there were several episodes that illustrated the need for this. And you're right, this arc was so tremendously significant to this season. I really felt for Archer and the crew as they grappled with various scenarios and situations that were so critical without having that directive. They were the ones who had to do this, and they have to be given credit for that. You know, it's easy for me to say that, for example, in Dear Doctor, I don't agree with the decision that was made, but that doesn't take away from my appreciation of the episode and what they and Archer were going through. You know, it's easy. I'm not in their shoes. So I think this is a really important part of Star Trek that they had to go through this without that directive, and it definitely showed the need for it. And thinking about this arc, it made me wonder, you know, I love backstory. I love hearing about the NX program and Starfleet of this day. I want more. It got me thinking these questions. What guidelines were they given? Were they given guidelines? What was discussed? 
Were there expectations of things? What was allowed and not allowed? Were there hypothetical situations discussed, scenarios? What were they authorized to do, not to do? This may or may not have happened behind the scenes, but I wondered about it and I want to know. Was there a handbook of, handbook. you're the guys, you know, you're the people <laughs> going out there. Let's have a meeting with the admirals and talk about potential situations here. It got me wanting some more backstory on that. So that's what came to my mind. That's hilarious because I totally want to read that handbook now too. And you know there would be a handbook because there is no organization that has that many different people involved in different areas and specialties and that much tech that doesn't have a handbook. I'm even, <laughs> even in the future, I'm pretty sure handbooks are still going to be around. Digital, but they're going to be around. But yeah, I, I think that's that's a really good point. I would like to know what, what he's been told and authorized and not authorized, especially before they had the quicker communication buoys out, and it would take a really long time for a message to get back to mm -hmm. Earth. So you kind of have to have a backup plan there. I am going to be thinking on that one for a while. And that kind of brings me into the next one, the Temporal Cold War, which has had some cool novelizations out there and plenty of fanfic. All right, I'm going first on this one because anyone who listens knows I adore this arc. Time travel and the mess it makes is right up my alley. I'm a sucker for any time travel story, even when you have to ignore a lot of plot holes in them or your brain turns to mush trying to figure them out or you put up giant poster paper and try to track it. I love that time is the next frontier that people from the future are exploring. I love the idea of the Suliban. I think they had the potential to become much cooler and more intricate villains than they did. And I'm still hoping that they show up somewhere in, you know, Discovery Timeline or something. I would like to see what's up with them now. I love Silic as one of the big players in this. Every time I hear his John, it just makes me smile. I like Daniels. I think he's an interesting character. I like that, you know, they had somebody there hiding in plain sight. I love that this season ended on a temporal Cold War cliffhanger. I still ache for resolution for this arc somewhere, somehow, in some show. Maybe, you know, the Section 31 show is, is, is Time Cops or something <laughs> like that. I still want to know the identity of Future Guy, and I, I cross my fingers that it's still happening because this, the Temporal Cold War is what got me hooked on Enterprise, and it is something that I feel like I have so much more that I need to know of. Please give it to me. <laughs> what about you, Melanie? Now that I've waxed Repsodic for a while. I'm with you, Abby. Like you, I'm a huge fan of time travel stories, any kind, any franchise. I love it. I also love history and futuristic stuff. So looking at alternate timelines is mesmerizing and fascinating to me. So I love that they gave us what they did in Enterprise with the Temporal Cold War. But like you, I want to know more. So I will just leave you with these thoughts. More, please. More Silic, more Suliban, more Daniels, more Future Guy, more factions, more points in time, changes. Let's find out more about Saren, who left us too soon. Mm -hmm. I want to know about her group. I want more. I thought they did a great job. And the whole idea of a temporal Cold War is just fascinating in itself. And I know as we go through Enterprise, we'll talk a little bit more about it in the future. And I look forward to that. Yeah, there's some good stuff to come. But we're doing a retrospective right now. So we're going to move on to a portion I'm calling the stats. Because we've been collecting grappler ratings this whole season for all the episodes. And I've done some uh, finagling of data. So we're going to talk about our top and bottom rated episodes. And I checked our spreadsheet. And not surprisingly, we align more often than not. <laughs> so I am going to start with our top ones. Let's talk about the wonderful ones. So Melanie, both you and I had Fallen Hero as our top pick, which should be no surprise to regular listeners. It was the only one that got a 10 so far from mm -hmm. us. 
And if you're caught up, you are not surprised that our second favorite is also the same, and it was Shockwave Part 1. Because that that is an ender. Like we were just saying, it's got temporal Cold War. It's got everybody. That that was a great one. So no surprises there. Now, the third through fifth places, third through sixth for Melanie, because they all tied. So I <laughs> had three that tied. Cold Front, Dear Doctor, and Voxola. And Melanie, you had four. The Andorian Incident, Dear Doctor, Voxola, and Shuttle Pod 1. So I think when you look at both of our lists there, that is some high quality, fantastic enterprise right up there. And I am not surprised that uh, we overlapped as much as we did. What do you think about our top, Mel? I'm loving them. And I'm not surprised either that we had some similar thoughts. And I think the fact that we had so many that were tied showed that there's some really stellar stuff in season one. Yes, there were some slower, lower points that I'm sure you'll discuss in a moment. But when you look at these episodes that you just mentioned, there's real high quality going on in this season. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting if you go back and listen to when we're talking about these ones, there were moments here where in each of these, we said, this was something that really hooked me into Enterprise. This is the one that, you know, first made me this or first made me that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we have a lot of emotional reactions to these ones because they are so good. And I know if I was going back and picking highlights without having done this, I probably would have come up with this list. And the other thing I just wanted to mention that regarding the episodes you mentioned for me, I'm thinking of at least two of them that made me misty eyed. <laughs> so I have to give them credit for that. Agreed. All right. So now for a little bit more of the, you said slow points and downers. So we both had a bottom four in this because we both had way too many that tied after that. So I'm going to go through each of us, see if we notice anything interesting. So I'm going to go four, three, two, one, and one being the lowest. So Melanie, yours were number four, Fusion. Okay. You had a tie for three and two with Fortunate Sun and Rogue Planet. And your number one at the bottom was unexpected. Mm -hmm. Now on mine, my fourth from the bottom was fusion. My second and third was a tie and it was unexpected and fortunate son. And my number one bottom was rogue planet. Mm -hmm. So I noticed right there is that we had the same bottom four, just in a slightly different order. That's really interesting that we chose the same cool stats. And, you know, if people love these episodes, more power to them. As, as we've heard before, someone's favorite is someone else's least favorite. And I appreciate that. In regards to unexpected, I still feel that there are major consent and violation issues in unexpected. But that's just my personal opinion. I love the Zerillion ship. But the more I've thought about Unexpected since we have recorded it, the less I've cared for it. So I'll just, I don't want to be a downer. That's the only thing I'll say diplomatically. But you know, Abby, even with these bottom of the pack episodes, there's usually always something, there's some redeeming quality in it to like and parts of it to enjoy. I mean, there, there are parts of Fusion that I love. I just find the assault story horribly disturbing there are parts of rogue planet that i like i like the whole race archer relationship even fortunate son which has some big issues for me there, there's always something to appreciate in the episode yeah i agree that you know the there even in the bottom there were always things that stand out there were always moments i liked there were always you know costumes there was music there was one plot point there was one character moment there was the b story there was an interesting tidbit. I mean, just the fact that on Rogue Planet, the Wraith sound is the same as the Changeling sound when they change. Mm. That's cool enough to make me want to watch that. And I had somebody tell me when we had that one coming up that they love that one because it's just so like campy and corny and schmaltzy. And that's like hits them right in the feels every time. So, you know, if that's what you're looking for one night, that's a perfect episode for it. And, you know, I think it's interesting, too, that. Uh, we'll talk about moving into this next part. We did not have half grapplers for the first part of the season. And we realized pretty quickly that we needed them to have a little bit more nuance in how we did this. And I, I wonder if we had started with that, 
if we would have seen well, we would have seen less ties, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. in episode ratings. And I, I wonder if that would have affected how some other things shook out in there. But I am not unhappy with either my top five or my bottom four. All right. Now, we couldn't leave the data part of this without taking a little bit more time to talk about grappler ratings. Like I said, we didn't have grapplers, half grapplers right away. We were also kind of afraid of starting too high. I know we've both talking about how we wish we would have given Broken Bow a higher rating, mm-hmm. but we needed we needed space to go up. And we weren't even halfway through before we were wishing we could tweak the ratings. So we decided that at the end of each season, we would give ourselves one that we could change to help ease the stress. And I'm not sure if it did that because I feel like I have the biggest list of secondary systems ever. But I'm eager to hear what episode you are tweaking, Melanie. So what's your one change? Okay. So regarding grappler ratings, it's so fun to rate the episodes. I enjoy that we talk about that. And I love it. I do want to say that I'm sure most fans would agree with us that they could change minute by minute, day by day, depending on my mood or, you know, what I'm watching comparison to another episode of that week. So I love doing the grappler ratings, but I just want to say sometimes I will give a rating and then the next day after we've recorded, yeah. I want to change that rating. They're very fluid, but it's a nice marker to see where we're at. So. Before I give my official change, I just want to talk about a few that if I could change them, I would. Starting with Terra Nova, I gave a seven. Looking back, if we had had the halves, I probably would have given it a seven and a half. That episode has grown on me so much. I just kind of love it. It's like a comfort food one for me. Strange New World has always been one of my favorite season one episodes. I think it's an underrated episode. I gave it an eight. And if we had had halves, I would have raised it up. Breaking the Ice, I gave a seven. And looking back, I think it deserved a seven and a half or an eight. That's a really solid episode of the season. Another one that I've grown to appreciate more over time. And I would like to have changed that one. (laughs) Another one that I would really like to change is Silent Enemy. I gave Silent Enemy a six. And while I still feel that that pineapple story, which I love as a standalone, I love the pineapple standalone story. It just didn't quite fit with the life or death of the other part of the story for me. I still feel that way. Even with that, this episode rocks. It's a lot stronger than I thought. So if I could go back, I would probably give it an eight because those silent enemy aliens were super cool. The way the Enterprise worked together for teamwork for that was really awesome. That was a riveting episode. And lastly, the other one I would change if I could, and I feel very strongly about this, is the Andorian incident, which I gave a 9. If we had had half grapplers, I definitely would have given it a 9.5, possibly even a 10. It's right up there with Fallen Hero for me. I also do not like to see Archer getting beat up. Putting that aside, this is one of the top episodes of the season for me. So I would I would give that one a boost. Okay. My official change. Dun 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 dun. (laughs) You already mentioned it, Abby. It has to be Broken Bow. I know we gave Broken Bow an eight. Looking back, um, I am changing Broken Bow to a 9.5. And when you read my top episodes, I really wanted it to be there (laughs) (laughs) because it is my favorite pilot of all time. I will say, though, Modern Trek is giving it a run for its money, but it still is my favorite pilot. Broken Bow, I adore. The only thing keeping it from being a 10 is I am not a fan of the whole decon chamber business, (laughs) but Broken Bow needs to be way higher for me. And Abby, I am so curious to hear what you're thinking about yours. All right. So I have thought about this, not as much or as deeply as you have, because I'm kind of okay with I made a choice. I'm going to stick with it. But there are ones that have niggled at me. And two of them you mentioned, one of them being Terra Nova, which I always like when I rewatched was was not so excited to get to. But I watched it with with new eyes this time. And I watched it after 
being in a pandemic and still being in a pandemic. And I think it was interesting to to look at the the isolation and all the different things there. And I just I had a new appreciation and Broken Bow as well for me. Like I I it's my favorite pilot. I agree that some of the new treks really have done a lot to challenge that, but it is it is my favorite pilot and I would would have put that one up if it wasn't for what I actually <laughs> And putting up. Okay. And first, let me say that I don't think our listeners know this, but Melanie does. That for some reason, I continuously flip-flop the names of Silent Enemy and Sleeping Dogs. Like, all the time. (laughs) When I'm talking about them, when I'm writing about them, when I'm putting them in notes, when I'm making folders. Like, for some reason, those two cannot stick in my mind. And they never have. Like, I can tell you the whole plot, but somehow those titles always get intermixed. And so I've spent a lot of time this season thinking about those two episodes because I'm trying really hard not to mix up the titles like I always do for some reason. And Sleeping Dogs, I I have thought about, and I, I'm good with my rating, but Silent Enemy, just like you, the more and more that I come away from it, the more and more I go back and I'm thinking about it. In fact, I think I have thought more about Silent Enemy than I have any other episode this season. And I feel like that really is telling me that that's my one that needs to go up because I had given it a six as well. And and some of my reasons are valid. I went back and listened and I watched again to make sure this was the one I really wanted. And and it is. I I don't think I was wrong about what I said on the episode, but I think that I was wrong about how much it would stick with me afterwards and how much I would go back to thinking about it. And that, that's a powerful Star Trek episode for me. So I'm actually bumping mine from 6 to 7.5 because I really can't stop thinking about that. And part of that maybe is from our friend Ross on Snaptrack, who made a hilarious screenshot of the <laughs> this silent enemy <laughs> aliens with a big old pineapple on their head, <laughs> which is one of my favorite things ever. I look for excuses to use it. I have to give Silent Enemy a lot more credit than I did when we went through this season. I love it. So now we come to another hard moment. We uh, are going to give out our very first Golden Porthoses. Because we are going to pick one thing, one moment, one overarching thing, one something about season one that is the very best for us. And I'm going to start with this one because it's a little bit personal for me. And I have to say, what do I talk about most on this pod besides cold opens? Costumes and food. It might be a little easier using your fingers. Vulcans don't touch food with their hands. Can't wait to see you tackle the spare ribs. Don't worry, we know you're a vegetarian. Looks delicious. Tell Chef I said thanks. Of course, sir. And really, I was going back and forth between those two, and it was kind of feeling like an impossible choice until I realized that really why I couldn't pick was because them together was what I wanted to pick. Because I've had multiple people reach out to me, people who have been listening to the show, and say they saw a cool costume or great food in Trek, old or new, and they thought of me. People are sending me tweets and articles about costumes and food. And when Dorothy Duder died, my timeline was just flooded with people sending it to me because she was the stylist, the food stylist on Enterprise. And the fact that people think of me when it's Trek costuming and food, even if it's only a little handful of people in the world, makes me smile and it fills my heart to hear that and I just love the little community that we have and that you know somewhere out there strange new world Pike is cooking and someone's going oh Abby's gonna love this and that just makes me happy and I love food in Star Trek and I love costumes in Star Trek and please keep sending me all the stuff because I can't get enough Abby, that's a great pick. And I want to count myself among those people (laughs) because you have taught me what, you know, I'm a big fan of Enterprise. I've been watching it for years, but honestly, I never really looked at the food that closely. I like the mess hall scenes. I always have. It's cool that they have food, but 
I never thought about it in a deeper way. And same with the costumes too. I've always loved costumes. I used to do a lot of theater, but you have inspired me to look more closely. And I have enjoyed hearing what you have to say about the food. It's gotten me to look deeper at it and appreciate it and love it. And I'll always think about that kiwi and strawberry. Yeah. (laughs) I thank you. I'm one of those people and you have motivated me. Well, thank you. That that makes me smile over here. All right. So now that I've had my mushy heart moment, Melanie, what's your golden Porthos for us? All right. Golden Porthos's pick. This, this was tough, Abby. It's been a big season full of a lot of stuff. So I decided to just go with a moment slash sequence. And when I really gave it some deep thought, I decided that I'm actually going to reiterate my very first Porthos's pick from Broken Bow oh. because it remains my favorite moment of the season. And I think it really captures the spirit of this first season for me, that feeling of exploration and adventure that was prevalent in this season. It really kicked off with that. I know in later seasons, tones can change a little bit, but this season was that bright-eyed sense of wonder for everybody. So I am going with the We Can't Be Afraid of the Wind sequence from the closing scene of Broken Bow with Archer's theme playing in the background. Just beautiful. I hope nobody is in a big hurry to get home. Starfleet seems to think that we're ready to begin our mission. I understand there's an inhabited planet a few light years from here. We've detected it, sir. Sensors show a nitrogen sulfide atmosphere. Probably not humanoids. That's what we're here to find out. Prepare to break orbit and lay in a course. I'm reading an ion storm on that trajectory, sir. Should I go around it? Can't be afraid of the wind, Ensign. Take us to warp four. Oh, that scene is so beautiful and so perfect. And I get goosebumps every single time. So that is an absolutely perfect first season Golden Porthos. All right. We have one more task to accomplish on this season wrap up. We are going to give the overall season one Vulcan's verdict. This is going to be the average rating of the episodes and season for each of us i have calculated out with our changed numbers what my average was based on my episode grappler ratings and i have done the same for melanie and we will see how close we are when we are picking without knowing what those numbers were so i'll go first and i will say that i love this season i really do the characters all have good moments some more than others but everybody gets a moment to shine It's a great blend of humor and heart and growth. And even with a few missteps and episodes that don't always age well, it's a really solid season one of a show. And it's a solid season of Star Trek. And it sets up some big themes and relationships that bloom in further seasons. And I was left that summer panicking about how they were going to get back in time. So that ended on the right note for me. So I would give this season eight out of 10 grapplers overall. Now, my actual number was 7.46 scrapplers, and uh, I think that's pretty close. And you know, I don't mind that I ended higher than what my episode totals were. Like I said, I would have changed a few here or there. I would have added a few half grapplers. And I think that the season as a whole, when you look at how some of the, the episodes interconnected, it boosts it up that little bit more when you see that there really are plot threads. They're pulling all the way through. So an 8 out of 10 grappler season and almost a match for me. So how about you, Melanie? Yeah, you know, 
this is a strong first season of television. Like you said, there are some stellar standouts in this season. I think they really set the scene with the characterizations and that they had a successful endeavor here for their first year. I, I still think the best is yet to come, but it is solid. And when you really think about it, Abby, they are doing something really unique here. They are out there all alone, relying on each other, meeting new species, venturing further than anyone has gone before. It's such a huge responsibility. All of Earth's expectations are on them. And they really pulled it together as a team. I consider this first year for them a big success. So I'm not surprised here that we matched again, Abby, <laughs> but I also gave season one of Enterprise a solid eight out of 10 grapplers. Very nice. And your average with your adjusted broken bow was a 7.11 grappler. Okay. So again, not far off, less than one point off. Yep, I'm happy I went a little higher, too. I think it deserved it. All right. So, Melanie, we did it. One season down, three go. We want to thank all of you so much for listening. We hope you have enjoyed the time that you have spent with us, especially in this big old recap bonanza. The best place to reach the podcast is on Twitter and all the other socials at First Flight Pod. And you can find me on Twitter at Abby M. Summer. That's S-O-M-M-E-R. Melanie, where's the best place to reach you? You can find me on Twitter also at ShuttlePod2. And that's T-W-O. We will be back soon with Shockwave Part 2, the first episode of Season 2. And as always, we leave you with this quote from Jonathan Archer. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us, woven into the threads that bind us, all of us, to each other. <laughs>